Hello, and in this next series of videos, I want to discuss the effects of non-ideal properties of real op-amps. Most of the circuits that we've looked at so far, we've been considering the op-amps to have ideal performance, perfect op-amps. And indeed, it's one of the useful properties of op-amps in that in many circuits, the behavior of real op-amps does closely approximate the behavior of these ideal components. But every so often, you're going to come across a circuit which doesn't behave quite as predicted, and that's due to the non-ideal properties of real op-amps. First of all, let's just do a quick reminder of what the properties of ideal op-amps are. They have an infinite input resistance, which means that no current at all flows into the inputs of an ideal op-amp. They have a zero output resistance, which means that no matter how much current is being taken out of the op-amp, the output voltage does not change. They have a infinite gain, and that gain is not a function of frequency. It remains infinite across all of the bandwidth of any signal that you might be interested in. And they have perfect differential gain, which means the output voltage is the open loop gain, theoretically infinite, times the difference between the voltages on the two inputs. But that's all. It's not a function of the power supply. It's not a function of what the absolute voltage levels are at the input only the difference between the voltage levels, and it doesn't introduce any other noise signals. Finally, an ideal op-amp is capable of accepting input voltages at its inputs and producing a voltage at its output anywhere between the positive and negative power supply voltages to the op-amp. Now, real op-amps do not behave like this. For a real op-amp, there is a small amount of current flowing into the inputs of an op-amp. So if you had a resistor between the input and the op-amp, the voltage at this point here is not equal to the voltage on the pin of the op-amp. They also have a non-zero output impedance. So in a typical ideal op-amp, this internal voltage here, Vx as I've called it in the diagram, would be the open loop gain times the difference between the voltages on the two input pins. And with an ideal op-amp, this resistor here, I'll call it R out, the output resistor, would be zero, which means that V out would be equal to Vx. In a real op-amp, of course, that's no longer true. R out is not zero, and V out would be Vx minus the output current times the output resistance R out, when IO, the output current, is flowing in that direction. For an ideal op-amp, the open loop gain A is not infinite. It's very large at low frequencies, but it tends to decrease quite rapidly as the frequency increases. And for real op-amps, Vx is not just a function of the difference between the voltages on its two inputs. For a real op-amp, Vx would be something like the open loop gain, which is not infinite and is a function of frequency, times V plus minus V minus, the non-inverting input minus the inverting input, plus an offset voltage. And it would also include an amount of noise added by the op-amp. There would also be a factor due to the average value of the two input voltages. If V plus and V minus were equal, but both equal to one volt, and if V plus and V minus were equal, but both equal to two volts, then the output of a real op-amp would be different. Another way of thinking about that is that the output of an op-amp is not dependent on the difference between the two inputs. It's dependent on V plus minus alpha times V minus, where alpha is almost, but not quite, equal to one. Finally, the output of an op-amp is dependent on the power supply itself. 
if you change the power supply from say 3 volts to 4 volts then the output would change slightly. So we can represent that by adding another term of voltage which is a function of the power supply voltage. One of the skills of op-amp circuit design is to design your circuits so that these imperfections don't cause a problem in your circuit. And we'll be looking at some techniques to do that as we go through the remainder of the videos in this section. That's a very quick introduction. In the next video, we'll have a look at the problems of these input currents in particular.